This is Dr. Roger Green in his Church History course, Reformation to the Present. This is session number 11, The Enlightenment in Germany and in America. I do like to read a little kind of devotional thing, but we've been, we haven't, haven't been together for a couple of Fridays except for our, we've been together for our, our discussion of the text and everything. So we haven't back actually teaching. So, um, and I forget, to be honest with you, if I read one of my favorite passages from John Calvin. So I don't remember if I did it or not. So, so for a little kind of just kind of devotional thinking kind of through some things, um, I'm reading from the beginning of Calvin's Institutes this morning. Um, book one, chapter one, and I, I love the way he, he starts his institutes. Um, he says, nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say, true and sound wisdom consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But while joined by many bonds, which one precedes and brings forth the other is not easy to discern. In the first place, no one can look upon himself without immediately turning his thoughts to the contemplation of God, in whom he lives and moves, Acts 17:28. For quite clearly, the mighty gifts with which we are endowed are hardly from ourselves. <coughs> Indeed, our very being is nothing but subsistence in the one God. Then, by these benefits shed like dew from heaven upon us, we are led as by rivulets to the spring itself. Indeed, our very poverty better discloses the infinitude of benefits reposing in God. The miserable ruin into which the rebellion of the first man cast us especially compels us to look upward. Thus, not only will we, in fasting and hungering, seek thence what we lack, but in being aroused by fear, we shall learn humility. For as a veritable world of miseries is to be found in mankind, and we are thereby despoiled of divine raiment, our shameful nakedness exposes a teeming horde of infamies. Each of us must then be so stung by the consciousness of his own unhappiness as to attain at least some knowledge of God. Thus, from the feeling of our own ignorance, vanity, poverty, infirmity, and what is more, depravity and corruption, we recognize that the true light of wisdom, sound virtue, full abundance of every good, and purity of righteousness rest in the Lord alone. To this extent, we are prompted by our own ills to contemplate the good things of God, and we cannot seriously aspire to him before we begin to become displeased with ourselves. For what man in all the world would not gladly remain as he is? What man does not remain as he is, so long as he does not know himself, that is, while content with his own gifts, and either ignorant or mind, unmindful of his own misery. Accordingly, the knowledge of ourselves not only arouses us to seek God, but also, as it were, leads us by the hand to find him. So that uh, beginning of the Institutes, knowing God and knowing ourselves, and how integrally related they are, I mean, really is a beautiful way to begin. Um, so that's how he starts. Well, that's just a little devotional for you. We're going to, we, I don't know if we'll finish up this lecture. We may, but let's just kind of remind ourselves where we are here. Lecture five on page 13 of the syllabus. So um, what we're trying to do in this lecture, um, and we're calling this lecture the Theology of the Age of the Enlightenment. And what we're trying to do in this lecture is see how there was a real response to the church, to organized Christianity, uh, to the scriptures, to um, uh, the revelation of, of God in Christ and so forth. Um, it's kind of as a backlash um, almost as you come into this age of the Enlightenment. And then what we decided we would do is take four places. We would take England, France, Germany, and America. And we would talk about those four places in relationship to that kind of backlash. Okay, remind ourselves that just in England, the response to Christianity was pretty measured in a sense. It wasn't too violent, really. Uh, it was deism. Uh, deism was a philosophy, um, and it was a monotheistic philosophy um, of God is up there, we're down here, and, and leading the virtuous life is the best expression of a good Christian in a sense. It eventually evolves into Unitarianism. Very measured response. The next country was France, of course, and we mentioned, uh, we mentioned uh, uh, naturalism as a kind of an expression of the French response to the church, and the French response to the church and to Christianity was very violent. 
um, a very violent response. And um, the French Revolution is a good example of that. Much less measured than the English response. So, and we mentioned that there were some people in the world that um, really kind of gave voice to this response to Christianity. So we mentioned Spinoza, we mentioned Voltaire, and then the third person we mentioned was Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, and we, we said that he, while born in Switzerland, though, he moved to Paris. So we use him as a, he did a lot of his writing thinking in Paris. So we use him as a kind of a natural model for the French response. Okay, he, he is himself, however, pretty measured. And we said we were going to, wanted to say four things about Rousseau. I think we said the first two. Didn't we, did we give two things about Rousseau? Did we talk about kind of feeling rather than rationality? Feeling is the hallmark of, we mentioned that, okay? And then did we mention kind of, um, kind of his, the return to nature, kind of, uh, kind of the noble savage imagery? Um, uh, getting away from, uh, you need to get away from all the oppression that the Industrial Revolution has brought, a <coughs> brought upon you. And you need to kind of stand back from that. And uh, if you're really going to understand what you're, um, you shouldn't live lives of selfishness, you shouldn't live lives of want, you shouldn't live lives of jealousy and so forth, um, you should live a more virtuous life than that, you know. And the, the noble savage can kind of teach us those virtues. I think we mentioned that. Did we get to number three and the importance of it? No, okay. So I've got th two more things to say about Rousseau that are helpful in terms of kind of underlining the age of the Enlightenment, but b both of these are also helpful to when we come to America as well. So, okay, number three is there's one place where reason is very important for Rousseau. So he is a product of the Enlightenment in this, in this sense. So there is a place where reason is very important. And the place where it is important is in the formation of government. Formation of government, um, reasonable people, are able to form and shape the government that they want or should have. So under this third point, now notice uh, Rousseau's dates. Uh, if you want, you know, there is this very the top of the top of the list here, 1712 to 17, um, 1728. So um, un, the, the, you know during that 18th century, um, what Rousseau is challenging is the divine right of kings. There's no divine right of kings. Governments are not instituted by divine right. Governments are instituted by the reasonable will of the people. And the people should have a say in the formation of government. So um, that becomes a real, obviously, a very, a real challenge to um, uh, French monarchy, right, in the, right in, as he's teaching in Paris. And um, some of that thinking, of course, is going to lead up to the French Revolution, which became infinitely more violent than I think Rousseau would have wanted it. But in any case, he challenges the divine right of kings. Now, governments formed by the will of the people, by the reasonable will of the people, governments formed by the common people, that's going to sound familiar when we come over to American um, understanding of the formation of government. So Rousseau is going to be very, very influential. As an Enlightenment thinker, he's going to be very influential upon American thinking. So we want to watch for that kind of connection when we come to it. So, Okay, and number four with Rousseau, as a lot of authors has, have said, Rousseau kind of helped to establish a civil religion. It wasn't a religion necessarily of the church. It wasn't a religion, certainly not a religion of Orthodox Christianity, but it was a civil religion. Now, what did that civil religion, what, what were the characteristics of that civil religion? Well, one characteristic was a belief in God, a belief in the supreme being. So this civil religion believed in God, believed in the supreme being, it wasn't kind of a godless you know, uh, religion or a godless society that he was after. So that's number one. So civil religion, number one, God. You know? Number two, a belief in personal immortality. There is, as, Rus uh, as this civil religion does believe in some kind of reward and punishments because they reasoned that um, that's not taken care of in this life. There are a lot of 
good people who suffer and aren't rewarded. There are a lot of evil people who do evil things and never seem to be punished. So there is some kind of a sense of a personal immortality where you, there's rewards and punishments in an afterlife of some kind. So that's number two about kind of the civil religion. So, okay, number three, um, and uh, the importance in this life of living the good life, the, the virtuous life. Civil religion, we want people to live the good life, the moral life, the virtuous life um, in, in, in this world. Okay. And then number four was the principle of toleration. Uh, the principle of toleration. Tolerating other people, other points of view, other religions, and so forth, but the principle of toleration is certainly part of a civil religion. Now again, not part of an organized Christian denomination, not part of an organized Christian de uh, church or something like that, but certainly kind of in the fabric of civil society. Um, now these, these kinds of things would also be true in, in, the, in America. As people are reading Rousseau over here, um, that kind of interest in civil religion has got to take root here in American soil as well. Okay, so that's number C. It's C in your outline, but we gave A the introduction, then we gave B England, the measured response of deism, C the enlightened respo enlightenment response in France, which was naturalism, but much more, le much less restrained and so forth. Any questions about that? Then we'll go on to Germany and to, um, Germany and to America. Okay, let's go to D then. Let's go to Germany. What I, the word I would use for Germany at this time would be a rash, rationalism. Let's go back to our categories here, but certainly rationalism. There's no doubt about that. Reason in Germany became kind of the touchstone for uh, understanding reality. So if you want to, want to understand the, the world around you, including the scientific world, where we have a day in which we're kind of celebrating the sciences here at Gordon, if you want to understand the scientific world, uh, you have to put reason to use in order to understand that world around you. So um, there is that external world that can be known by reason, and many people thought known by reason alone. So Now another thing about Germany, what you get in Germany is kind of a belief that there's an order to the universe. Okay, And what what our job is, what the job of human beings is, is to harness, harness that order. There's an order in the universe, let's harness that order, let's, let's use that order, and let's, um, let's allow the use of that order to, um, to kind of define our lives. So the rational use of order um, in order to define the living, including scientific life. That becomes very important in Germany, and with the rise of German universities, that kind of philosophy of rationalism becomes, becomes pretty dominant. Now, we will see this also, we mentioned the other day, but where we, where you will also see this in art. You will see this in music. You will see this in the fine arts. You will see kind of a rationalism in terms of artistic expression whether it's painting or whether it's music. And like I say, if you like Handel Haydn, if you would like to belong to the Handel Haydn Society, my wife and I belong to that society quite a few years, um, if you like that kind of music, that 18th century music, um, you would, you know, this, you would understand this kind of stuff. Um, very, very kind of, it sounds very rational, very logical, very ordered. The music is very ordered, isn't it? So, so that becomes important, so. Okay, now, <clears throat> how did this work out in Germany? How did this work out in religion? That's our most important. That's what we're interested in. How does this rationalism work out religiously in Germany? So, well, I'm going to mention two things, um, how it worked out in religion. First of all, I'm going to just mention how it worked out in religion in general. How did it work out in kind of a religious philosophy? this rationalism. Everything has to be ordered, everything has to be known rationally in order to count it as true and meaningful and so forth. Well, as a matter of fact, it worked in terms of religion in general, it worked out with a very severe criticism of the Bible, of the church, 
of uh, Christian history. So uh, if you can't, if, you, if, you, if you're thinking of religion, that religion has to be measured only by reason, by reason alone, by rationality alone, then the Bible, the church, and a lot of Christianity went out the door. This is where you get the rise of what we call biblical criticism, really severe, heavy-handed biblical criticism. Uh, comes in the 18th century in Germany, 19th century, as people are so critical of the Bible, of Christianity, of the church, organized religion, and so forth. It got to such extreme that in Germany, there were people even doubting the historicity of Jesus. So they doubted the historicity of Jesus. They said Jesus was a made-up figure. The Gospels were written very late. Uh, they made up Jesus as the ideal human being, kind of, but there never was a Jesus of Nazareth who lived in uh, Nazareth, lived in, uh, ministered in Galilee and Judea, died on a Roman cross, was resurrected, and so forth. They denied all of that. So the first result is really a pretty radical biblical criticism that comes in now and really, really challenges the church and the thinking of the church. No doubt about that. Um, so. The second result was a, uh, a redirection of Lutheranism, because Lutheranism basically is the state church in Germany. So Lutheranism is redirected in the 18th century in Germany. Now, how is it redirected? Well, one, I think one thing we forget about Luther, just, just to go back to Luther himself for a minute. Luther was very, you know, this larger than life figure, but he was very creative very imaginative, very creative. Um, he didn't want a church that just kind of people sat in the pews on Sunday and didn't think through anything and just listened to the sermon and so forth. He, there was a creativity about Luther, an imagination about Luther, a, a passion about Luther for the gospel and for the truths of the gospel and all this. So you had a larger than life figure and Lutheranism in the first generation following Luther took on those kinds of characteristics. Okay? Now, but once you get to the 18th century, and here's our word right at the top here, scholasticism. Once you get to the 18th century, what developed was a Lutheran scholasticism in the 18th century. What developed in the Lutheran church was a very dead, um, scholastic, rational kind of religion and the common people were going to their Lutheran churches on Sunday morning and they were hearing, basically they were hearing treatises, theological treatises. They weren't hearing the Bible come alive through the preaching like it did through Luther. So there was a deadness to Lutheranism which settled in uh, 17th century, 18th century. Now there are, long story short on this second one, so the first one was just religion in general. Second one is specifically with Lutheranism. But there is going to be a movement that is going to take a look. There's going, to be a, there's going to be a group of Lutherans. They're going to take a look at this and they're going to say, is this what the church is intended to be? Is it it's dead, scholastic, kind of? No. They're going to say, no, this is not what Lutheranism was in, ever intended to be. And so they're going to try, they're going to, try to bring Lutheranism alive again. And that movement was called pietism. I don't have that on the list. We're going to lecture. Actually, it's on your syllabus because the first group in the next lecture we're going to talk about are the pietists. But that movement is called pietism, bringing the Lutheran church alive once, once more to what it was intended to be. OK, so Germany, this kind of rationalism in Germany. Now, let me stop there for just a minute before I move to America. We've got England, we've got France, we've got Germany, all responding in the age of the Enlightenment, but responding to the church and responding to Christianity and sometimes pretty harsh criticism about the church, Christianity, Christ, um, so forth. But So anything about these three? We're going to move to America in just a minute. But Okay, let's come over to these shores. Let's come over to America and see what we have in America in terms of the age of the Enlightenment. Okay, before we do, let me just, oh, uh, well, we've got, I think any terms we've got are there. So before we do, let me just say <clears throat> how much I love my job at Gordon College. Let me just say how delighted I am to be here now in my 41st year at Gordon. So I'm going to say things about the Enlightenment in America that you might not all agree with. 
So, and I will understand that. Um, I'm very sympathetic to that. I'm going to try to explain the Enlightenment in America as I understand it. So are we okay with that, if I can do that? You don't mind if I do that, do you? And then, and then let's see if there are some differences of opinion about that. Or let's see if you don't quite... I'm not trying to sell you anything, but I'm trying to lay it out. So I have to do that. You know, I think it's important just that you know that. I'm, try, I'm just try, trying to lay this out. Are you okay with that? So let's go. Let's see what happened in America. And I begin by talking about the Founding Fathers, basically the Founding Fathers, and by them I'm thinking of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, um, um, uh, Benjamin Franklin, people like that. Okay, so here's my premise, and then I'll develop it a bit. Um, there was, in America, there was pervasive, in American public life, there was a pervasive deism in American public life. There's no doubt about that. Deism had come over from England and had really taken shape and taken form, taken hold, I would say, of American public life, especially American intellectual life. Um, the, the life of the universities, the life of many of some of the churches and so forth. Now, that's eventually going to evolve into Unitarianism. But the first Unitarian church in America was not until after the Revolution. So the first Unitarian Church was not until 1785. So we don't have deism evolving into, kind of taking that denominational form, actually, into after the American Revolution. But we have it taking shape during the time of the American Revolution. So deism is really, um, is really, is really important here. So, OK. So here's my thesis. My thesis is that the Founding Fathers were basically enlightened deists. They, they picked up on enlightenment principles. Um, and in the founding of America, they, they put those enlightenment principles to good use in the founding of what they believed was, was what was going on here. So what is that to say? I do not see the Founding Fathers that I have mentioned, I do not see them as flaming evangelicals. Um, I do not see them as people uh, who are committed to what we would call orthodox evangelical Christianity, biblical Christianity. Some of you may see them in that. And there were some of the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, for example, who were that, no doubt about that. But the people who had the most impact um, on American public life and somewhat on American religious life in terms of the Founding Fathers, I would see as enlightened deists. OK, so let me just use Thomas Jefferson as an example of that. Thomas Jefferson, um, uh, ha he developed what he called the Jefferson, what became known as the Jefferson Bible. I don't know if you've ever seen the Jefferson Bible. But the Jefferson Bible, what Thomas Jefferson did in the Jefferson Bible was he eliminated all of the miracles of Jesus because he didn't think the miracles of Jesus were true to the, to the story, um, that these were made up uh, in order to show Jesus to be divine, which he wasn't, of course, according to Jefferson. So the Jefferson Bible gets rid of all the miracles, ends up with a Jesus that he thinks is just a nice person to follow. We want to be a moral man like Jesus was a moral man, and we want to live by the Beatitudes. Well, you can't cut out the miracles of the New Testament and still have the Jesus of the Gospels. I mean, you just can't do that and have the Gospel story because they're essential to the Gospel story and to the story of the kingdom. That's what Jefferson did. So I would see he's doing an enlightenment kind of deistic, kind of Unitarian kind of thing in doing that. Okay, so, so I would say that what follows from that is that America was founded on enlightenment principles, not biblical principles. I'm talking about the f actual founding of America here. Um, it wasn't founded on, I wouldn't say it was founded on biblical principles but Enlightenment principles. Let me use an example of that from the Declaration of Independence. OK, you know this as well as I do. The Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be what? We hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident. In other words, the Declaration of Independence does not say, we hold these truths to be biblical. 
they're using a philosophical kind of self-evidence, kind of common sense realism here. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. And among them are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. The deists believed in the creator God, of course, but they didn't see God as the redeemer. Um, they didn't see God as the savior. Um, so it didn't say we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men were created. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created. They, they were endowed by their savior God, by their redeemer. With certain, it doesn't say that. It says we're endowed by their creator. That language is very deistic language. Self-evident truths, the creator God. So I I make the case then that what happened in America uh, was. Uh, was de what happened religiously and politically was a deism came into America and, and helped to um, pr sh um, provide, I, I would say, the philosophical foundation for American public life and for American religious life, as, especially as we moved Americans, some Americans moved into Unitarianism. So, okay, now um, let me just go back here. Sometimes in America, there are some writers who are downright savage in their attack on Christianity. Now, people like Jefferson was not. Uh, the deists, the enlightened deists, were not savage in their attack on Christianity. They were just using enlightenment principles, deistic principles, and so forth. Some people were, and a perfect example of this is Tom Paine, Thomas Paine. And there he writes, 1737 to 1809. Okay, what Thomas Paine does in Age of, now notice the title of the book, Age of Reason. Uh, so this is not the age of revelation from God, this is the age of reason. And what Thomas Paine does in his book is he really does attack Orthodox Christianity. Um, he's really pretty savage in his attack of Orthodox Christianity. And what he does in the book basically in an Age of Reason he basically says the only thing that's going to work in this 18th century is deism. So this, the age of reason, the book is kind of a defense of deism. And so therefore, it's a defense of those kinds of things like natural reason, uh, the rights of people, all people, political equality, and so forth. So, so, um, so um, this kind of, um, this kind of a, again, it's not, People like Jefferson, I don't see Jefferson as making that kind of a savage attack, but I see someone like Thomas Paine, whose book was very influential, making a pretty savage attack upon Orthodox Christianity and, and trying to espouse for this nation, trying to espouse kind of natural rights. And you get those natural rights by common sense, by reason, by looking at the natural world, by natural theology, and all kinds of things, you know, the civil liberties that that um, does. Okay, the re and I'll give you a chance to, I want you to question this and talk about this, but I'll give you a chance to do that. Let me just say, what this was then was a theology by way of anthropology. What developed in our country then in the 18th century was a theology by way of anthropology, that is understanding theology by way of, of our own human rational endeavors and so forth. And so there was kind of an exaltation of, um, of human beings here. So, Okay, now what we want to take note is that this is a, a, a d direct <coughs> turning point from the Puritans. So think back to the Puritans. Think back to Boston, a city set on a hill. Think back to the pilgrims in, in uh, Plymouth. Think back to Roger Williams in Rhode Island. Think back to kind of the high Calvinism of the Puritans. Their theology was not an exaltation. It was not by way of anthropology. Their theology was by way of revelation of God in the scriptures and in Christ. What you have now is a whole turning, a tremendous turning in a sense, of both public life and religious life um, toward kind of an anthropology now. Uh, away from a high Calvinism of the early Puritans, the first Puritans, 
toward more of an Arminian theology, more of a freedom of the will theology of human beings. So there is a major turn in American public life, philosophical life, religious life going on here. This is pretty major um, since the Pilgrims landed in 1620. So we're not even 200 years old when this turn is taking place. So, it's a, it's, it's, so you could easily contrast the Pilgrims, Puritans, Pilgrims, and the, um, and the framers of the Declaration of Independence, for example, the Founding Fathers. That would be the easy contrast between kind of a high Calvinism on the one hand and a Arminianism and a growing interest in freedom of the will on the other hand. So, so there it is. So there you've got a whole different world going on here. So, um, and that would come into the next century. Okay, let me just give, what's the final result of this deism in American public and religious life? Let me just say what that is. Let me give four or five things here. And then I want to open this up for a few minutes, see if, you know, I want to talk about this. But what's the result of this kind, if, if I'm right, and I'm not trying to make you believe that I'm right, I'm just trying to present a case here. But um, if I'm right, if deism was the, um, the kind of the religious viewpoint that got this whole thing going, um, what are the, oh, I also meant to say too, uh, notice how important Rousseau was in all of this. These people are reading Rousseau. And what does Rousseau say about government? Of course, there's no divine right of kings. Governments are formed by the will of the people. Governments are not formed by, you know, on down, even though I think George Washington probably wanted to be king rather than president. That's my own feeling anyways, but I think he really wanted to be a king. But governments are not formed by the, on top down. Governments are formed by the will of the people. So you see how important Rousseau was. Okay, having said that, what are some final results of deism in America? Let me just click them off for you. Number one final result is a, a, an emphasis on natural revelation so, and natural theology. An emphasis on natural revelation by way of natural theology looking at the world around you and making some theological deductions from what you see in the world around you, all right? That is completely different from a special revelation taught by the Puritans. God has specially revealed himself in the scriptures and in Christ, especially in Christ, of course. That is different, so that's one thing, so. Okay, number two, second kind of result of all of this is um, the laws of the universe. God has established the laws of the universe, but he does not meddle in the laws of the universe. The laws of the universe work themselves out by a preconceived kind of rationality here, by a natural theology. That's how we understand the laws of the universe. We do not understand God as deists would say. We do not understand God as breaking into the universe in any way and kind of interfering with the law, natural law that he has established. So that's number two. So, Okay, number three, we've already mentioned before, but it bears repeating. Uh, Jesus is a good moral example. So Jesus is a good moral person, a good moral example, and we should follow his example. And we mentioned the other day how C.S. Lewis put the lie to that in a sense. Um, he's, you can't have Jesus as a good moral person. He's either Lord or he's a liar. Um, so he's one or the other, but he's not, you can't take a middle ground on Jesus. You either see him as Lord or you see him as a liar. Um, he's, he's, just, he's just deranged. He's calling himself God. So that's number three. Okay. Number four, with this exaltation of human reason, this ability to reason, this ability, this rational ability that people have, even in a sense to control the universe through scientific means, a growing scientific means, nothing like we have today. But um, with that, then, you do have the outright denial of original sin and even a denial of um, radically sinful actions. These people didn't really believe in sin. In sin. Um, they certainly didn't believe in original sin. They certainly didn't believe in some inherit, inherited uh, depravity or something like that. And they, they, they didn't really believe in sinful actions so much, you know. We're pretty good people. 
pretty virtuous people. We recognize there are some problems and so forth. So there, there was that that came as a result of that. So, and then number five, the fifth thing that came as a result of this was kind of a salvation by works for these people. Um, the ethical is exalted. You're saved by the good deeds that you do. That's what's going to, um, God's going to look favorable, favorably toward the good deeds that you're doing. So, um, so there was that that came as a result of all of this as well. Okay, so what do we have in America? We have a deism in America, a, a revised deism that really is exemplified in the formation of this civil government under which we live. Um, and exemplified in the religious life of, of deism, which evolved eventually into Unitarianism. All right, um, that's my case for America. Um, what are we going to do with this case for America? Are we gonna, I'm not asking you to buy it, but uh, yeah. Um, in terms of its oh. relation to Puritanism, yes. a lot of the founders of America were Puritans. Yes. Um, and I think that they were yeah, that's a good question. The, the Founding Fathers came from various, um, you know, various religious traditions. Some of them had Puritan line to them, but many of them, uh, many of the Founding Fathers actually came from a British Anglican tradition. And the British Anglican tradition out of which they came already was turning deists, Unitarian, Unitarian in England. So it's pretty natural they come over there bringing that with them. So a lot of, and especially the South, because the Anglican Church was quite large in the South. Um, so um, it wasn't after the war because most Anglicans went back home because they were British, so they were supporting the monarchy, but um, and not supporting the revolution. But um, but a lot of them came from in that south in the south. They came from that Anglican tradition. That's right, and it was already a deism, flowering deism. So then, right. I mean, what did then the Puritan colonies look like at this? The Puritan colonies by this time. The Puritan, I remember in the, in the lecture we talked about, um, when we talked, uh, the last lecture, we talked about a, a growing commercialism making them less evangelical, less religious, or, a, or, or they became less evangelical, less religious, so they, it grew the commercialism, that kind of thing. Well, that's taking full flower now. In, and in, at the time of the revolution in America, many of the congregational churches um, uh, were turning toward Unitarianism. So they were deistic. Uh, they weren't yet Unitarian in the legal sense because, like I said, the first church didn't become Unitarian until 1785. But they're, they're certainly moving in that direction. Um, so that's what it kind of looks like um, in, on, on the scene, you know. Um, during the Revolution, a lot of people who had been religious are no longer religious. They turned away from religion in pretty strong numbers during the Revolution. And I expect the reason for that is because they became so involved in political cause that they didn't have time for religion, you know. So, um, so you, you've got a lot of very fervent um, political focus at the time of the Revolution and a less religious focus. And then it does get complicated with people like Thomas Jefferson forming his own Bible or it gets complicated with George Washington, who, as far as we can tell, attended church very, very little. Um, he was Anglican, did go to an Anglican church when he went to church, but he wasn't what you would call a churchman, a person who was really involved in the church and you know, wanting to contribute to the church and so forth. Um, so, yeah, does that help at all? Um, yeah. Hope, I'm just, yeah. Jason. Uh, so I'm not arguing one way or the other. Yes, know, that's but, fine. Uh, that's do you know about the book the, called The Jefferson Lies? I, there's a similar book called The Light and the Glory. I'm, I'm more familiar with The Light and the Glory, which is so. I I think. Oh, but go ahead. So, go ahead. So I haven't actually read it, but um, the, um, my intern, intern Pastor Summers at the church on New York, and the pastor there right. has read it. And he's right. talking about the book and telling about the premise, which is, I mean, the subtitle is Exposing Myths You've Always Believed About Thomas Jefferson. Right. And, right. like, the chapter on, so he, I, like I said, I haven't read it, so I don't really know if you had, right. but I hadn't. he makes yeah. the argument that um, the whole thing about Thomas Jefferson creating his own Bible right. was not because he didn't believe in the miraculous and the miracles of Jesus, but 
he was editing it as a Bible to use for evangelism to the Native Americans, uh, simplifying it to basically simplify the gospel. Right. Are you asking my opinion about that? Because that's also in the Light and the Glory, books like the Light and the Glory. I, I, there's no evidence of that. That's the problem. There's no historical evidence of that, that, that that's why he did that. Um, the evidence seems to weigh the other way, that he was a deist, that he didn't believe in the miracles and so forth. All these things are, that's right, absolutely debatable, or arguable, no doubt about that. There's a book called The Light and the Glory, years, years and years ago I did read that, and that's, it's the same thing. It's, it's kind of the, um, you know, um, ca calling the question professors like Roger Green at Gordon Co I mean, he didn't actually, meant, you know, but pe yeah. professors who teach that these people were deists. Um, so he, he believes that they were evangelicals and so forth. The problem is the record doesn't sustain that argument. And then if that were true, if these people were evangelicals, the Declaration of Independence should have read completely different from the way it read. It should not have appealed to self-evident self arguments, philosophical arguments. We hold these truths to be biblically it should have said. Now, if the Puritans had written the Declaration of Independence, that's exactly what the Puritans would have said. Puritans, would, if we had fought the revolution back in 1650 or something, Puritans would have said, we hold these truths to be biblically revealed to us by God the Father, um, that all people are created equal. They're endowed by God the Father through Christ our Lord, our Redeemer God, that you know, God has given to us. Um, you know, these virtues, and we should live out these virtues, and we can see all this in the Bible. I mean, if the Puritans had read, written the Declaration, it would have been completely different. But the, the written material of these people is deistic language that they're using. But no, I buy your point, absolutely. And, and not, everybody's, not everybody believes this. Not everybody at Gordon College, I would say, would hold to what I hold. But the good thing is at Gordon, we, we're free to teach as we you know, see it. But we understand, on this issue, I understand that there are certainly, um, not everybody sees it the same way, absolutely. That's your um, is it possible that that language was used because they believed in a separation of church and state? Well, they did believe in a separation of church and state. And, and, um, uh, and, and that, that language kind of, um, which I say that language kind of identifies that separation of church and state. That's true, absolutely. Um, but right, right. Yeah. Right, right. Uh, they did put the Creator a lot in the story. Uh, so God as Creator is there a lot. Um, um, yeah, that's a good point. I, I. I would see we've got we've already got evangelicals who believe in the separation of church and state. Baptists who came over here, they were very strong in the separation of church and state because the state had been so oppressive in the old world. So separation of church and state was a was a belief shaped. I mean, not only shaped but held in common by deists and Baptists. Um, so that was a something a lot of people held in common, no matter what their kind of religious viewpoint was. So, I think they're, they definitely are trying to strike common ground, no doubt about that. My feeling is they're doing it from their own point of view, basically, especially in the narratives that we have. Um, that would, but, yeah. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Um, and then also in terms of original sin, if you read yes. the Federalist Papers and stuff, yes. I mean, they clearly have a negative viewpoint of humans and that they're incapable of doing the right things, which is why they put so many safeguards. That, that's a good point. They do believe in sin. That, that's true. Yep. They do believe that people could get off the rails and fall. They do believe in sin because they believe so heavily in free will. So the freedom of the will, that's a, that's a basic kind of theological component. And as long as you've got a freedom of the will, it means you can say no to God. And, and be, yeah. But that's a good point, Hope. That that's right. They're putting safeguards in for us um, because they do realize that... Um, there are people around who do bad things. Yeah, that's a good point. But they do it by their own free will. They don't do it because they're, there's some inherited depravity in them or something like that. But, uh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, um, I mean, later on in his life, Washington went to church less and less, less probably mainly because of his political activity. But he was actually ordained as a deacon in the Right, yeah. And that's...
Yeah. yeah it was right. The term Episcopal wasn't used till after the Revolutionary War. To, to be, and the reason it was used after the Revolutionary War is to say that um, if we use the term Anglican, yeah. it yeah. sounds real British, you know, and we can't have that. We got to use the term Episcopal. So, uh, so, so, yeah, right, yeah. You do get these, and you do get you do get a picture of Washington kneeling in the snow. I mean, and praying to God. Um, uh, so the question is: Is this was this very much part of his life? Um, that's a good, but that's a good point. That's right. I want to be as as fair as I can on this because I because it's so easy for professors to be very heavy-handed on something they you know really are passionate about, and and I'm not here to do that. I'm here to. Um, just give that point of view and uh, get get you thinking about it, and not um, I'm not here to indoctrinate you on this. But I have to be really careful of this when I teach this, um, and also I teach a course in American Christianity, so I've got to be careful when I teach it in that course as well. So. Well, anything else um, here That's worth discussing, though? Um, no doubt about that. And and Jason, you worked with a pastor who 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 was upset about people teaching this, uh, that, I mean, that yeah, these people were deists. It wasn't like, I don't think it was a state teacher, but he was, right. it's from um, their pres evangelical Presbyterian church that right. has like a strong um, view of like in America being right. a Christian nation needing to return to that. Right. So like he read right. that and was like, because like David Barden, the author, he's, his whole point is trying to return to, right. you know, what our nation right. was founded on. Right. Right. But it's interesting because I'm just looking up now, and so apparently the book after like got a lot of negative response. Right. And there's a lot of right. like people saying it wasn't that credible, and so Thomas Nelson actually stopped publishing it. Right. And now right. So he like right. pu posts like published this like 20 page response to all the critics. Right. So it's right. It's a it's, it's a debate. Clearly very up in the air. So it's up in the air. Not, it's so. a debate, and it's a debate, and it's not a debate limited to. The liberals versus the evangelicals, kind of, uh, uh, because I'm evangelical, and so there are many evangelicals who would espouse what I'm espousing here, no doubt about that. Um, and of course, um, you know, we have to just ask ourselves. I mean, it's worth a question asking: um, Does God deal? It seems to me that in the Old Testament He dealt with a with a nation, with the nation of Israel. But then, once you see this revelation of God in the scriptures, don't you see him now dealing with the church, the body of Christ, his body here on earth, which to me is universal. It's, it's not limited to America. It's in every, every place where the living word of God is. Um, that's, there's the church. There's the body of Christ. So is it, is it that God deals with a nation, as he did with Israel, or is he dealing with the church, and the church is universal, and the church is multi is, is across all nations. I think that's a worthy question to ask. Um, so I was in Zambia, ministering in Zambia just quickly um, a few years ago, and I was surprised, you know, I, Christian nation, I'd always heard it here in America, but I not never heard it in other contexts. And the president of Zambia when I was there was preaching about Zambia as a Christian nation, that Zambia was God's chosen nation and to do God's work in this world and so forth. Very, very interesting that he had this Christian nation kind of identity for Zambia. I mean, I had never heard it uh, applied to other countries, but here, you know, probably the last place I would think I would hear it would be Zambia. I mean, who would, who would guess? But there it was. But anything else here on this? Okay. Um, I'm going to close up in a minute. Let me just do this. Let me just tell you where we're going to be going. Um, and um, just from your page 13 of your um, of your syllabus, and then we'll pick this up on uh, pick this up on Monday. Um, what we are now going to see in the next lecture, lecture number six, evangelical resurgence in the church. What we are going to see now in the in the 18th century, 19th century, we're going to see a turning of the pendulum back to. Um, back to orthodoxy, back to the church, back to historic Christianity, back to the roots of historic Christianity. So what we've seen in this lecture, lecture five, is a, is a movement away from those things, a kind of a turning away from those things in places, in Western Europe especially. And now in the next lecture we're going to say there were people who said, nope, we've got to return back to, to our roots. 
And, um, and we're going to look at three pretty major movements. We're going to look at, um, in Germany, we're going to look at pietism. In America, we're going to look at the Great Awakening. And then in England, we're going to look at the Wesleyan Revival. These were three major resurgences in the church. Um, and uh, so it takes us, this next lecture is a fairly long lecture because it takes time to work out these three, these three, um, uh, this three evangelical responses, in a sense, to the way the world was going. Um, in Western Europe and in America. So that's just uh, uh, by way of introduction there. Um, just for sake of time, I'm not going to start that lecture today. Um, we'll start that on Monday. Have a great weekend. We'll see you on, uh, see you on Monday. <laughs>